Hello, 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 ladies, and welcome. So today I'm going to be reading from the book, The Sojourner's Passport by Khadija Nassif. The book is a series of essays compiled from her blog. And this is another book that I've had for quite a while now. But as I've mentioned in one of my other videos, I'm going through my archi archives right now, which means my older books. And I'm reading through these books that I think would be really helpful to some of you. So I'm going to read starting in chapter 13. And I just have to say this is a really, really good book. And I do recommend that all uh, black women read this book. Because it's just so much information in here that's really helpful. Things that you may not know about. Especially if you're someone who's under, um, if you're like 40 or under. It will give you a lot of history about things that have happened that have caused things to be the way that they are today. So I'm going to start reading in chapter 13, which is titled, Let's Get Serious About Vetting Men, Part 1. Do you really want a fatherless man to be the father of your children? Since this is a meeting for current and aspiring sojourners, I'm not even going to bother discussing the widely known undesirables that any prudent woman would totally screen out of her romantic life. Convicts, drug users, and playboys. Instead, let's talk about something that I hear very few African American women mention when they discuss the husband potential of various men. Whether or not these men grew up with the father. I find this quite strange because the composition of a date's family of origin is one of the first few questions that old school African American parents want answers to. Quote, who are his people? Meaning, where did he come from? This is also one of the first few questions that many middle class African American parents will have about the people their children date. Parents from any parents from many other ethnic groups, such as African, Asian, including South Asian and Middle Eastern, typically go even further with these inquiries. Parents from these groups strong tend strongly to discourage their children from dating people from broken or dysfunctional homes. They do this because they understand that their child isn't just marrying an individual, but is actually marrying into another family's background. Modern Western culture likes to characterize such screening as intrusive and cruel, but it's actually quite kind in the long run by sparing people unnecessary problems. The harsh reality is that most people do what they saw their parents do. The example set by their parents is their default setting, good or bad. So let's consider this in terms of fatherless men. Let's consider what it might mean if you select a fatherless man to be your husband and the father of your children. I just want to go back um, for a minute where she's talking about just how in functional families, when a young woman or a young man wants to m marry someone, the family is involved in asking questions about the person. And that's the way that it's supposed to be because no one will know you like your family. <clears throat> and I'm not talking about relatives. That's different. I'm talking about a family. Families look out for each other. Families help each other out. Families protect each other. And when I say protect, unfortunately, for some reason, when people hear the word protect, they always think that it's physical. But to me, that's not the first thing that comes to my mind. When I hear the word protect relating to family or friends or anything of value, to me, that means that if someone is, a, is family, you are not even going to sit in the presence of people speaking badly about that person without sticking up for them. You're not going to sit around and allow people to trash talk them, um, gossip them back. You know, that's not family to me. That's relatives. 
families look out for each other. And like I said, they protect each other. So when you have a family and as a young woman, you're going to them and you're saying, I'm seeing this guy, the family will want to meet this guy. And that's the way that it's supposed to be. And if he's resistant to that, that should make you as a young woman suspicious of him. Because what is he trying to hide that he doesn't want possibly your dad or maybe an uncle of yours or your brother or your cousin or even maybe your your mom or aunt or someone to notice about him? What is he afraid of? And I really do think that it's so important to return to that. I know that there are a lot of broken um, families and a lot of people don't have families, but they have relatives. I'm of the opinion that family or none, I, I will be alone before I deal with a bunch of relatives because they're just like strangers. They they don't look out for each other. And it's why I think we have so many of these issues in the community. And I use the word community loosely because I agree with everything that she's saying in this book, which is why you really need to get it and buy, get this book, buy it and um read it because it's a really good read. But I don't want to rant too much about that. But I just wanted to stop there because I know that a lot of people do feel like it's none of their um, it's not their grandmother's business or their sister's business or their cousin's business if they want to be with somebody. And that's totally incorrect, because these are the people who should something go wrong. You're going to want to help you. You're going to look for want their support. Um, their time, their money. So you you can't do that. I mean, you can and you will suffer the consequences of it. But that's just something for you young ladies to really think about. So now I'm going to go back to um, this chapter. So do you really want your children's father to be a man who has never seen what a living full time husband and father does, has never seen a father be a part of everyday routines like finding their kids socks or shoes when getting dressed for school, has never seen a father play an integral role in creating family holiday traditions, has never seen a father put up the family Christmas tree each year, has never helped his father put up the family Christmas tree each year, oops, twice, has never seen a father play an integral role in creating family weekend traditions, has never seen a father get up before everybody else in the house to clear the snow off the steps and the sidewalk that his family will use to go to school or work that morning, has never seen a father clearing the ice off the windows of his wife's car while doing the above. And she goes on and lists several other other things, but I think that you get the point with just hearing about those, those few things because as mentioned, people model what they see. And it's completely different being a woman who didn't grow up with a father versus a man, because you learn how to be a woman from your mother, your grandmother, your aunts. You have all of those women around you. So you learn how to mother by them. But if you are a man and you have no father, no grandfather, no no one in the household Um, or in the family that is showing you what it is to be a man, and especially the father in the home with you daily, it makes, it's it's a big mess. Um, And it makes men very effeminate, in my opinion. I I see a lot of that now. I am very grateful for the men um, that were in my life as I was growing up, my grandfather, my uncles. I'm grateful for them because they were able to teach me things, talk to me and show me things. They were not perfect, but it's why I am the way that I am today. And I'm very grateful for that. Very grateful for that. So again, I'm sorry if I'm ranting, but this, this chapter is just so good. And it's a really short chapter, so I can read through it. Um, yes, I'm just going to keep reading through here. There are countless other specific questions that I could ask along these lines, but you get the idea. It's something that bears some serious consideration. Before somebody writes in to talk about how President Obama is a fatherless man, let's carefully think about that for a moment. First, common sense should tell us that the exception is not the rule. Common sense should also make it plain that Obama is atypical in many ways. 
Being fatherless and raised by whites in Hawaii and Indonesia is probably quite different from being fatherless and raised under other conditions in other places. I also suspect that, for political reasons, he has downplayed the, the role his Muslim Indonesian stepfather played in raising him. Second, there's no rational reason to assume that President Obama is such a great father. I know many of us enjoy the symbolism of the pub, of the pub, excuse me of the publicity photos he takes with his daughters. But let's try to think clearly about this for a moment. I find it interesting that nobody really stops to consider just how absent he's been due to a political career that he voluntarily chose during huge portion, portions of his young daughter's lives. To a small child, absent is absent. From previous interviews, his absences seem to have been a source of friction in his marriage. He lightly touched on this himself during his infamous Father's Day speech when he said, I say this knowing that I have been an imperfect father, knowing that I have made mistakes and will continue to make more, wishing that I could be home for my girls and my wife more than I am right now. Addendum. Internet Ike Turners and Ikeettes are losing their minds about the very idea of African American women adhering to universal standards used to evaluate men. So, I see that I'm going to have to enforce accountability for this conversation. This means that I won't post any anonymous comments during this conversation. She's um, adding this because these are taken from her blog and sometimes she would allow comments to be posted and then she would um, respond to them. But it made for good conversation and throughout the book you can see some of that too where she has included some of the things that people have had to say about her essays. So then there's another addendum here. These series of posts are about the universal standards used by heterosexual women across the planet to evaluate men as potential husbands and fathers. Fatherlessness also affects girls, but since heterosexual women are not seeking to marry and raise children with other women, the effect of fatherlessness on girls is not relevant to this conversation. Therefore, when interjecting themselves into women's conversations about how fatherlessness impacts potential spouses for themselves, concerned <laughs> internet Ike Turners and Ikeettes need to present their concerns about father fatherless women at lesbian blogs. It should be elementary to note that lesbians are the only women who would be evaluating fatherless women as potential spouses for themselves. So it just goes back to what I was saying before, and I was really glad to see that um, she did talk about that in this book, because again, as a woman, you learn how to be a woman from your mother, your grandmother, your aunts. You learn that from the women around you. So a man not being there for a girl is not the same as a man not being there for a boy. So I'm going to um, jump up, up quite a bit back in the book, and I just want to read an addendum that she has here. Uh, it's a section that she has about dating, but I thought that I wanted to close out with this because I don't want to, I, I know that these topics are very triggering for a lot of women because there's just so many layers sometimes of what we go through and um, how some of us are tormented on a daily basis around these things. I've seen it. I know it. I've experienced some of it myself just the constant stereotyping everywhere that you go of people thinking that if you are not married um, or if you're divorced, that you're looking for a partner, which is definitely not always the case. Like, like we are all just desperate, you know, and yeah, the, the numbers are out there. We know they exist, but every black woman is not going to every place looking for a man. So people really need to stop with that. So I'm going to read the addendum she has here. My sisters, please remember you were robbed of your birthright. It is your birthright as women to have reasonable opportunities for legitimate, wholesome marriage and family life. 
You were robbed of this by narrowed options and circumstances. These circumstances are the result of African Americans buying into corrupt dogma. There is no need for you to feel embarrassment, shame, or a feeling of stupidity. There is no need for you to feel embarrassment, shame, or a feeling of stupidity. There is no need for you to feel embarrassment, shame, or a feeling of stupidity. There's no shame in being robbed. You were robbed. There's no need to blame yourself. Most people accept without questioning whatever is considered normal in their immediate circles. If nobody explicitly warned you about any of this, how would you know? And with that, I'm going to close out. Um, as I said before, it's The Sojourner's Passport by Khadija Nassif. There is another chapter in here that I do want to come back and discuss, and I may do that on another day. But I just wanted to record this portion because I've been seeing lots of videos about vetting men. And again, it goes to the whole um, climate and what's going on on YouTube right now. So I thought that this would be really good to share, and I definitely recommend the book. And she also gives you, um, if you buy the book and you can get access to daily inspirational quotes. So that I thought that was also something really nice that she did when she created this book. So please do um, look into getting the book and supporting the author. And please do subscribe if you enjoyed this read. Thank you.